Welcome to another edition of Ask Why. And ask why there is injustice. Ask why we can, how, how can we bring e equality to society? And today on this episode of Ask Why, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce an organization that's doing well beyond the whys, the hows. How can we make impact and change within our society? Today, we have the I Am movement here with us. And we have the wonderful Jonathan Barkant and his um, trusted right-hand man, um, Mr. Kevan Kalpanath Miraj. Gentlemen, thank you and welcome to another episode of Ask Why. And we really thought it was um, essential that we brought you on the show today simply because we're in a situation where climate change is very much a buzz term. You know, there, there seems to be a lot of anxiety around it, but it, it's really critical to, to highlight organizations that are not only addressing the issue of climate change and climate justice, but are actively implementing actions, not only locally, but globally to mitigate and to move forward um, as a as a global society, and you know, I to put it in, I don't know how to put it in another word. You're making the world a better place. So thank you, gentlemen, and please give me a minute to read both of your very substantial bio. Jonathan Barkant is a civil engineer who specializes in soils, water, and environment, and is the founder and managing director at Vetiver TT Ecological Engineering Solutions Limited. He is also the co-founder and managing director of I Am Movement, an NGO driving positive social and environmental change in TNT, and which has also become one of the leading civil society voices in the Caribbean on climate change. Vetiver TT EES Limited specializes in the use of vetiver grass as a bioengineering tool to assist with slope stabilization, erosion control, soil and water conservation, flood mitigation, and the rehabilitation of degraded lands and waters. Vetiver TT implements projects for private and public clients, as well as NGOs and development agencies for community education and empowerment projects and knowledge distribution initiatives, especially towards building climate resilience. And I think that really is the key word right there. So, you know, thank you so much, Jonathan. And we're going to be talking quite a bit today about the Vetiver project. But please let me let me introduce um, Kevin. Innovation has always been Kevin Kalpanath Maraj's main driving force within his life. His main goal is to be one of the leaders of change in the Caribbean when it comes to fighting the climate crisis and moving towards a minimal waste lifestyle. Kevin pursued a degree in chemical and process engineering at the University of the West Indies with the intent of making an impact with the oil and gas sector. Upon graduation, when economic instability suddenly faced this sector, he shifted his focus to the processing field and subsequently worked at Oldendorf Carriers for three years. When he learned to work as a part of a multidisciplined and multicultural team while simultaneously obtaining his certified associate project in project management. It was during this time that he came across the quote, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. No, and I really want to kind of leave, leave the introduction on that note because this is a, a Catholic focus program and Pope Francis reminds us, we are stewards of creation. And we have two engineers with us. And, you know, I find it very interesting that both of you somehow came into this field. So I want to start with a little background. I want to get your story, but because I know we have a full presentation and audience, I promise you, this is going to be a really informative and very interesting um, discussion today. But before we get started, I want to hear your story. How did how did these two engineers somehow end up in working towards climate justice? Jonathan, let's start with you. Okay, Dominique, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique, for having us here today. It really is a pleasure. 
I know you've had a fantastic program before with other members of the team, well, with Kevin, but also with Nicole, you did before. So thank you very much for having us back. And yeah, just to share a little bit about my background. So I'm a civil engineer, as mentioned, specialized in soils, water, environment. But I actually studied in Canada. And, you know, I come from a family of eight kids. So for me, it was just kind of very important. Uh, I felt to get off my parents' budget as soon as I could. So I sort of, um, you know, just found myself, um, you know, trying to get the first job as soon as I could, as soon as I graduated and that type of thing, always being kind of conscious in those regards. And uh, that led me to just sort of, you know, and I'm sure it's probably a common path faced with many people at university and engineers and so on. But I wound up getting a job with, you know, my advisor and that sort of thing in his company. And so I found myself, you know, in a quote unquote good job that everybody would term as being a very good and successful job. Um, working with one of Canada's largest engineering companies. But it just happened to be serving, you know, some of the biggest clients we were serving were mining, you know. So while I wasn't actually working for a mining company, I was working in the mining industry. And so really and truly, I got this first-hand view as soon as I left university, working on mega projects, large mining projects all over the world. I was based in Canada, but I was work working in northern Canada. I worked in Greenland. Um, and finally, I actually worked in Panama for a year. And, you know, I've seen mining, how it could be done properly. And, of course, we do depend on, uh, you know, on mining and, and things for our daily life. You know, if we, anyone who has a phone, you know, we rely on, we rely on various metals. All these different things come from mining. But I've seen how mining can be done properly. I've worked on mining projects that were very successful, very well managed. For example, in northern Canada, it's like working on the moon. So it's, you know, it's not much to disturb, if you will. But it's, uh, you know, it's done very effectively, safely and so on. But in some cases, you know, the serious questions are raised about is this really applicable, you know, and should this really be done? And, um, you know, so I, I, I saw a bit of that. And then finally, what happened was I was working on a project that was, um, while I was still based in Canada, but the project is in Panama. And the project entailed, um, well, it was the second biggest copper mine in the world being constructed. And what that really involved was the leveling of a lot of rainforest. You know, the total project here is up to 10,000 acres of rainforest. Right. So for people in Trinidad, just for a little context here, just picture from um, Mocha up to Blanche Shares. I know this is a, this program probably reaches regionally, but I'm sure on all of the Caribbean islands, mm -hmm. you can probably picture your masses and swaths of rainforest and just imagine that being completely leveled. And so I was really seeing that happen before my eyes. Um, mm -hmm. At some points, flying helicopters over and just, you know, just red, you know, red uh, wasteland, if you will, where there once was forest. And, um, you know, I guess it's one thing if that was being, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to ever justify that that could be done sustainably because to remove that type of forest and biodiversity and vegetation is, it's, it's hard to justify that there's a sustainable way to do it. Mm -hmm. But I would say that if it was being done a bit more sustainably, I think I might have found a way to to with that industry. But the truth is it was being done in a very poor way. It was resulting in mass destruction and was not being managed very well. And that really resulted in a, in a strong sense on my part of feeling that, you know, I absolutely had to leave that industry altogether. A bit of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde experience, if you will. Some days, you know, performing well, getting a lot done, but then other days just really feeling a crushing sense of, am I really going to stay with this? And so all in all, that kind of feeling stayed with me for a while. And I found myself desperately searching for green engineering solutions. Um, mm -hmm. At least during my office time, of course, I was a lot of time in the field, but during my office time, every free kind of moment I had kind of just Googling Google green engineering solutions. And I would say, you know, you put something in your mind long enough, you search for it long enough and, and you find it because that search one day led to um, Vets of a Grass being introduced to me. Um, in fact, by my, my brother who was living with me at the time and he was studying environments and he came home and sort of just mentioned it to me and it, I searched it and it completely took, took, uh, took my attention. And I don't know if anybody, again, probably turned out focus, but if you've you ever heard of the cocoa jumbi, for those people who kind of get it, uh, cocoa and chocolate, mm -hmm. well, I think it's fair to say that the vetiver jumbi took me. <laughs> even though I was actually not in Trinidad at the time, I was in Canada and the plant doesn't even grow there. But I found uh, it, it blew my mind to see what was being done with it around the world. It's not a new solution. It's been here in the past. It's indigenous knowledge, but has been lost. But there's been a global effort through the Vetiver Network International to revitalize it in the last um, 30 years. Um, and really through the best practices through the use of this plant, which I know Kevin probably spoke about in the last program, Nicole, as well, and you'll hear a bit more today. But while this plant has been here, there's a correct way to use it and there's an incorrect way to use it. And if you use it incorrectly, you know, um, you don't get the solutions. And in much the same way as you can have bamboo in your backyard and you see 
it's a bamboo patch cause and disturbing you or whatever and, and not giving you dropping leaves everywhere when you see it as a bird and a nuisance is in the same way we can turn on youtube and see stunning videos of people making the most exquisite things with bamboo and using it for all these different needs so again god has given us all of these absolutely wonderful tools you know that we have access to but there's just varying levels of knowledge which we can have around it and um it's it's really it's again the same way they study hemp bamboo for their things that is something that has a tremendous world of knowledge in it and a capacity to serve as a, a green and climate resilience tool to help people protect their homes properties houses from landslides while creating livelihood economic opportunities etc um and so yeah it's been a, quite a journey in terms of discovering it getting into it beginning to use it promotes on those same mining projects in Canada but ultimately leaving that all together and finding my place back here in the Caribbea promoting in Trinidad and Tobago and then you know beginning to move from there well we're glad to have you Jonathan because the reality is your i mean we are a small island state and countries such as Canada which are a mass massive you know arguably they're not going to feel the effects of the climate climate change until much later than us 2050 and beyond we're going to feel it pretty much immediately so i think you're in the right place at the right time so welcome back and well i can't even say welcome back you've been here and active for quite a bit but um we're glad to have you with us right awesome. here in TNT. and kevan please introduce yourself and how how did you leave the oil and gas sector and, <laughs> and move to to a more sustainable sort of industry hi dominic Dominic, nice to be here this morning. Thank you for having us. But yes, no, I, you know, more or less the same thing that Jonathan would have spoken about. Um, I think at a young age, you came across the term climate change. Um, and being in a small island developing state, you kind of recognize that we are going to be impacted um, heavily by the, the changes in the climate. And, you know, while, while I did like chemical and process engineering, um, what i figured what i eventually found out is that i like solving problems like that that makes me happy that's like that's my passion solving a problem or refining a process um and that led me into you know chemical and process engineering and then you know as i started to learn a little bit more about the effects of climate change and all the different um, information that was being presented you know, like paris agreement etc i came across that same code that you mentioned earlier that we we have inherited it from our ancestors we've borrowed it from our children right and that stuck with me it it appeared a few times quickly and that you know really stuck with me and i was like okay yeah that's really deep you know if you think about it you've just borrowed it from your kids your grandkids your great grandkids like we might be okay for the remainder of our lives but what do what kind of planet are we leaving behind for our children and their children and so on you know and that what is what really got my mind thinking and i started to look for ways to reduce my waste my personal waste um so you know stuff like using less plastics trying to recycle a bit more all these different things and then you know as it would have it one day i came across vetiver grass you know and it was true um i am movement and when i you know i just started to research vetiver grass never heard about it before and when i recognized the potential for this grass and the, the various things that it is already doing i told myself you know i need to definitely be a part of this movement i need to definitely help in any way that i can and six months later well guess what i'm in i am movement and working on this project and it's just an amazing opportunity so that's really what turned me you know to this side of things from the whole oil and gas sector Well gentlemen all I can say is god certainly had a plan for both of you so <laughs> thank you very much um Kevin I'm going to switch it over to you now please I know you guys came ready with a fantastic presentation so please feel free to share so we can get a real a sense of what the miwi green project is how vetiver is being um used cuz John says you rightly said there's a correct and an incorrect way to utilize this plant so please share your presentation with us sure will do and what makes this project so unique as well you know it's at using utilizing the vetiver grass as a green infrastructure tool but it's our, it's our first national project at this level so it's you know it's, it's really like the perfect project to 
um, happy viewers get involved. In. So, so, like you mentioned, we had to talk this morning a little bit about in program. Um, so we just broke it up into about five five parts and the general introduction, what is Miri Green, what is the vetiver system, the Miri Green workshop, and next steps. So before I begin, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on who is I Am Movement. So I Am Movement is a nonprofit organization founded in 2014 with our mission to facilitate an, an enlightened and empowered relationship between people and the environment. With a vision to be the to be a sustainable organization serving as a catalyst for positive social change on environment and climate action in the Caribbean. Our team is Wakan, who um, is on this call with us right now. Ms. Nicole Valentin, our project management advisor. Mr. Charles Wakan, um, so he was in regional work. Um, Charles was in the position of acting project manager we providing that support locally. And we have Ms. Leah Radbear, Assistant Project Manager, myself, Kevin Kalapnat Maraj, Head of Communication Strategy, Salvation Yalams, Workshop and Administrative Assistant, and Caitlin Romani, our Handicraft Coordinator. So the Miri Green Program. The Miri Green Program, an education empowerment program for climate change adaptation, is implemented in partnership with the Green Fund Division, the Green Fund, sorry, Division of the Ministry of Planning and Development and co finances over a two year period from January 2021 to December 2022. It will incorporate the Vetiver system and the Vetiver Education and Empowerment Project. And, you know, the addition of these two systems throughout Trinidad and Tobago with special focus or specific focus on eight project communities, and these communities are Lopino, Cedros y Caracas, Murugan Environment, East Port of Spain in 2021, and in 2022, we're going to be working in Santa Cruz, Parman, Cameron, Diego Martin, Brasso Seco and Environment, Forest Park and Environment. And the goal of this program is to actually promote and support greater overall climate resilience in Trinidad and Tobago relating to soil and water related challenges through the use of the vetiver system as a green infrastructure tool. And the fun thing about this is that Mary Green is the first of its kind initiative within the Western Hemisphere to support, so to support and promote the implementation of vetiver grass and the vetiver system. Our program objectives is basically to drive widespread education and uptake of the use of the vetiver grass on the system, support the development of livelihoods in communities to develop sustainability in the application of the vetiver system as a green infrastructure tool to drive greater overall awareness about the realities of climate change. So these are the small ways that you can change their daily lives and make a huge impact on reducing their overall um, impact on the environment. So you've heard me talking a lot about what is well, vetiver grass and vetiver system. So let me just play this quick video just to let you know what vetiver grass is. It's really informative. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that there now. Vetiver grass is a tropical plant species which can now be found in over a hundred countries around the world. It spans the history books dating back further than 3000 BC due to its very wide range of uses. But perhaps most interesting is its deep and fibrous root system, which can extend up to 10 feet deep within the first two years, making it a powerful bioengineering tool to tackle many land and water related challenges. When implemented correctly according to the vetiver system, the humble vetiver plant becomes a simple, green and powerful means to help prevent landslides and protect infrastructure including roads and riverbanks and properties such as homes and agricultural land facing erosion and slippage. Extreme rainfall events saturate the soil reducing the overall stability of slopes and very often this is when property damage and infrastructure losses occur. Many landslides take place with a slip surface less than 10 feet deep and in these cases, vetiver grass established in hedgerow formation can improve the overall slope stability and the geotechnical shear strength of soils by up to 40%. Heavy rainfall events cause other problems too. For example, hillsides lacking forest vegetation can get heavily eroded as water picks up speed traveling downhill. And this can cause sedimentation of drainage systems, rivers and coral reefs, as well as flooding in valleys below. 
Vetiver hedgerows can hold back up to one foot of fast flowing water, which means that each row can play a role in slowing down hillside runoff, effectively changing the hydrology of watersheds and mitigating flooding downstream. This also promotes soil moisture and groundwater recharge, and hedgerows tend to capture loose topsoil and seeds, forming natural terraces and the regrowth of native species, as a pioneer system for reforestation in tropical environments. Other uses of vetiver grass include the treatment of contaminated lands and water through phytoremediation, such as landfill leachates and industrial wastewater, as well as the production of beautiful carbon-negative handicrafts, such as baskets, mats and chairs, and essential oils for soaps and perfumes. As a C4 plant, vetiver also captures an extra atom of carbon dioxide compared to about 95% of other plant species which are known as C3, and this makes it a valuable form of biomass for topsoil regeneration and a fuel source where small briquets can be fabricated from vetiver leaves and used as a replacement for charcoal. All these benefits make vetiver grass a holistic tool which can help to build social and climate resilience in tropical countries in terms of green infrastructure protection, community empowerment and livelihood opportunities through its wide range of uses. But I, I, what I find very interesting is this whole idea of, of the C4. Um, it, it's, could you could you kind of break that down a little bit more, you know, for for the the, the layman like myself? No problem. But Johnny, um, I don't know if you want to jump in here. Yeah, sure. So basically, Dom, what's um, C4? What it means is most plants are, are actually C3, you know, so most plant species, 95% of plant species are C3. So C4 simply means that it takes in an, an extra atom of carbon. You know, so it's a very small amount of plants in the plant kingdom, you know, if you will, that are C4. So what that means is it takes an extra carbon, which we all know is good for climate change, you know, reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. But that, of course, gives the plant, you know, it contributes to the plant's unique properties as well, you know. So, you know, as we'll talk about soon, you know, um, I recently got back from a, a, a trip up the islands conducting the VS uh, vetiver system and vetiver education empowerment projects on several islands in Dominica, St. Lucia, and Antigua. And um, we've done the same in Tobago. So as you can see, and then we also did in Grenada last year. So as you can see, we really are beginning to expand across the Caribbean a bit. But the reason I mention this now is because as an example, after spending time in Dominica and St. Lucia, which are known to be very, you know, mountainous terrains where landslides is a very recognized thing. It's a serious issue. And therefore the vetiver can work very well in those landscapes. And it's just immediately understood as well. This can protect our roads. This can protect our homes, this can protect our infrastructure. But then we had Antigua next, you know, and I have to say that I was a little, you know, Antigua is a bit flatter. It doesn't suffer with as much landslides and that type of thing. So I was a little, you know, kind of, um, I knew for sure we had a specific thing we were targeting there, which is wastewater. And I'll mention that later if applicable, but sort of um, tackling leachate and wastewater coming out of a landfill. But that said, on the, on the broad country level, I was a little, you know, curious to see you know how the interest and, and 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 sort of pick up on it would be but when we got there you know i have to say it was a wonderful country to be in a wonderful country to to connect with the people but also to really through that training to see how engaged they were and how interested and um coming back that you know the link to that c4 and the carbon you know is basically that you know antigua is also quite a dry country mm -hmm. and therefore you know, vetiver again has so many uses and one of them is mulch, you know. So, you know, in agriculture, you know, this all has to go with us, our need to go back to the older ways. You know, we're all very aware by now of the standard, you know, um, practices of, of traditional agriculture. With, that has just forgotten a lot of this old ways that work very well that our ancestors used to use. And now it's all about the chemicals and just as much chemicals as possible for fertilizer to kill the pests, to kill the weeds, etc., but there's very, very natural ways to, to deal with some of these things, you know. And so a, a, a concept which is familiar to all, to all farmers who are probably all farmers in general, but especially farmers who are trying to move towards sustainable practices a bit is, you know, the fact that you can chop and drop and put leaves on your ground and it serves as a mulch. You know, you, you create this by chopping and dropping leaves. It creates this bed of material. And that has multiple benefits. One, it keeps down weeds. So weeds grow up a lot less. It keeps moisture in the ground instead of having bare soil that's drying out in the sun. Over time, it breaks down and build back, builds back topsoil, releasing nutrients into the soil. You know, so it's this incredibly simple thing that 
I would say all farmers that are beginning to think a bit more sustainably are trying to practice. You see it here, even amongst the tra traditional farmers, they might put things like wood shavings around their plants and all of that. But wood shavings has its own issue. Sometimes it has chemicals. Sometimes it um, takes up nitrogen. Vetiver grass, you know, again, being a C4 plant, um, has this capacity to sit on the ground for up to three months serving these purposes, you know. A lot of other typical razor grasses, if you sort of take a regular razor grass and you put it on the ground using kind of local terminology in the Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. you'll say that like, give it about two, three weeks and that will melt out, you know, with the sun and the rain and all that, you know, so that will kind of be gone in that time. Mm -hmm. But Vetiver will actually sit on the ground for two to three months around around your plants with this beautiful bed of um, mulch. I actually, at some point when we hand back to Kev, maybe I'll pull up some pictures to show you of that. But the point is that um, the same aspect of the plant that, that, you know, takes in that extra carbon is what makes it a strong material and therefore good for things like mulching, building back topsoil, keeping ground moisture, as well as, of course, it's used as a, a good material for, for handicraft making, whether it's baskets, mats, chairs, all of that. So that is tied into the, that question about carbon. You know, it takes in carbon, making it a stronger material, but it takes in more carbon than most plants do. You heard me talk about the vetiver system. You heard Jonathan talk about the vetiver system. So what is the vetiver system? The vetiver system is simply the, the best practice method for the use of the vetiver grass as a green infrastructure tool to solve a wide range of soil and water challenges. Sounds like a lot, but it's basically using vetiver grass in the correct manner that it's supposed to be used to get the, the results that you want it to actually have, right? Because um, we've had issues in the past where persons would have planted vetiver grass but didn't utilize it some correctly and they still ended up in some of the problems that, you know, the grass is supposed to solve for them. And we've had actually come back in and implement the system correctly and um, they, they, they're fine now, you know? So it's, it's that that's gap in knowledge that we're trying to bridge um, and really bring back to the, the, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago because vetiver grass has been here for over 70 plus years. It's, you know, it's nothing new, but the knowledge has been lost and we're trying to reintroduce that knowledge for sure and in Trinidad and Tobago. Because I mean, if you go to Parliament, you, they, they would refer to it as vetiver, but it's the same grass because it has many different names. Um, Tobago is called uh, and Jonathan actually told us about this in the trip in Tobago. It's actually called cockroach. And the reason for that is it also repels pests. What is so it called? Know. Cockroach grass? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Could you say, like, say John, that it's, um, just to say that it's, it's one of the names. We wouldn't say it's called that exclusively, but it's yeah. known for different names. And, you know, it's also called bedding grass. You know, some of the older generations use it as material in bedding. You know, it is quite known for that actually and then cockroach grass is because a lot of older persons women especially you know but no and perhaps you do even because you know i i actually knew that growing up a little bit as well but basically the roots have a fragrance a sweet fragrance which is used to make essential oils and perfumes mm -hmm. and so people really knew that you can take these root bundles and put them in your drawers in your clothes etc and what they do is they repel um, insects cockroaches etc so I, the name cockroach grass in Tobago comes from that. <laughs> I haven't seen that in years, but it's so, it reminds me so much of my grandmothers and my great aunts. And I, I don't know if this is one of the product products that you, um, that you, you, the house of vetiver is going to be developing, but I, I highly recommend it. I could tell you for sure that I would just buy it simply for the nostalgia. Absolutely. Well, yes, you know, you can absolutely get those products. And, and, and it's true, you know, actually, a lot of people do come getting it for that nostalgic memory. It's a sweet, beautiful fragrance and scent. But we also get a lot of um, mothers, young mothers, or people getting um, stuff for their, for their friends that are about to have babies to put in their baby clothes. It's used for that a lot as well. Mm -hmm. But um, House of Etivier, yes, that, co that community-based company does sell the root bundles and they are available. Wonderful. Sorry, Kevin, can please No, no, it's, it's fine. But yes, yeah, so the vetiver system can actually be used for many applications, um, land slippage, infrastructure, infrastructure protection, topsoil loss, promoting groundwater recharge, agricultural land regeneration, leachate, contamination sites, you know, like John Jonathan would have mentioned earlier. And lastly, well, w one of the other things it can be used for is supporting livelihoods through handicraft and commercialization of the vetiver system solutions. Which we'll get into shortly. 
Um, so in this picture, you know, just to give you as a, a really good understanding of what we've done in the past and what vertebrates can actually do, in the top picture, you're seeing, you know, the before installation on Queen, Queen Anne Beach. So you, know, you had a lot of coastal erosion. And then if you look at the picture below, you're actually seeing, you know, now some earthworks were done. So it's a combined approach. It's not just the vetiver system alone. They did do some earthworks, but vetiver was planted in hedgerow formation. And it has been used and been quite successful in preventing the coastal erosion um, at Queen Anne Beach. So, you know, persons can actually see this in Trinidad and Tobago. It's not, it's not that it hasn't been implemented previously. It, you know, it's there. It's been done before. And Kev, I'll just make a quick mention of that while you yeah. have that slide up, you know, just to mention that um, this project was done, you know, by the Coastal Protection Unit. Well, let's say, you know, it was under the Coastal Protection Unit. Um, we implemented, you know, the Vetiver system solutions and all the landscaping you see there. Vetiver TT, that is, um, as a company, but I am movement then played a very critical role at quote and quote kind of adopting the site um, through a project we have with the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB Lab, that gave us um, two years, three years actually, you know, but to support various installations all around Trinidad and Tobago, working with different partners, include communities. We even had Unit Trust Corporation come once and do volunteer planting and so on down there. But, um, but it's important to recognize that we're very, very grateful that after the years of promoting this, and it's taken quite a while, I mean, we're talking about this since 2014, 15, we've had various presentations over the years, you know, including with ministries and so on, um, Ministry of Works in particular a few times. But I'm um, really, really grateful, and it's good to see that basically the Ministry of Works actually specced the Vetiver system into their drawings and design. So after that amount of you know, time, they, they recognize the value. And so they actually put into their design to say Vetiver system solution as part of this project. So yes, it was a bigger project that included a contractor and earthworks and some gabion baskets, but Vetiver service is a critical part of it. And that is critical, you know, and this is all part of what takes time, as you could imagine, Dom, you know, People are not quite sure. It takes time. They want to see examples, pilots. But we do have a number of successful cases, including, well, quite a number by now, but successful big cases as well, including with, you know, key partners such as, uh, you know, C3 Current, San Fernando, Ubi Town, Tucker, et cetera, that have all invested in these solutions from a private standpoint. And now we're seeing the likes of Ministry of Works and, and UD Cot and NIDCO beginning to recognize it. It still needs to take up at a much greater level, you know. Um, we're hoping to get kind of more involved with, with roads and highways eventually. But um, it takes time. But this was, it was just really great to see that this was a successful example of a, a government um, implemented, well, not even community-based, but, you know. You also mentioned but, private, um, private organizations coming on board and seeing a need. So that actually, I think, is, um, is, is in, want, beyond interesting, actually very encouraging. That, um, you know, in terms of now people looking the wider, because there's this, always this perception that this is the government's responsibility. But the fact that we now have um, um, corporate and well, companies coming on with well, the business sector, understanding that these sorts of um, strategies need to be implemented is fantastic. And what I to support this kind of strategy is one, it's so I don't want to say it's so simple, but in a, in a sense, it really is. It, it's the simplicity and the effectiveness combined make it a really powerful intervention. I think that's very important to say here. So sorry to cut you again, Kev. No, 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 it's fine. That's totally fine. The presentation, um, Kev, is a conversation piece. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right. So moving on. So there's another example of the vetiver system being implemented. Now, yes, I have two pictures up here, but I really want you to focus on the picture on the right. And we love to refer to this picture because it's one of those that a picture speaks a thousand words. Perfect example. So if you notice, um, I, yeah, if you notice, you see my cursor, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the vertebrae hedgerow that was planted. You notice this landslide right after it, right? So this is up on the hills of Paramen. So actually notice there's a farm. So there's a farm in Paramen. Uh, the farmer planted his crops planted the vetiver hedgerow. This landslide wasn't here at the time. When the hedgerow, after a while, it got a, um, a, reach a, a maturity, this landslide came. And if you notice, it stopped literally yeah. at the end of the hedgerow. So it just shows the power of these roots, you know, in, in um, soil stabilization. If that wasn't there, 
that farmer could have lost his whole crop. Right. And you well, know, that's just crop, but importantly, his land, eh, Kev, for his, yeah, for planting and that type of thing. And, yeah. and his house, just to highlight, you don't see that down, but the house is mm-hmm. not far higher up than this than this this plantation. So that's the type of thing where really and truly, you know, if you picture landslips often progress, you know. So that could have absolutely continued and continued and worked its way up to the property, you know. Right. So it's it's a good telltale picture for sure. Um, let me talk about the Vetiver Education and Empowerment Project model, uh, what we refer to as VEEP, the VEEP model. Um, so basically what that is, is just, you know, it's, it's three components. It's the Vetiver system, the Vetiver system workshops, the Vetiver hand workshops. And we implement this a lot within um, the communities and the three training levels provide varying degrees of knowledge, education, and experience, depending on the levels of engagement which take place through the educational activities with our Mary Green um, technical and field team. Uh, so we actually look into training like 10 to 15 community part- participants in the vetiver um, system uh, for the opportunity as well as the handicraft workshops in the opportunity to produce crafts for sale individually or through a national community focused brand called House of Vetiver, which you mentioned earlier, right? Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of success in that in the past. Like we've had crafters that's, that are committed, have sold their products um, through House of Vetiver and are now earning, you know, some money, some income, you know, to help them have a sustainable livelihood, basically. And, you know, the nice thing about these crafts are they're also carbon negative. So you're producing these beautiful crafts, but then you're also, you know, helping the environment as well because these crafts are carbon negative. What I think is mm-hmm. particularly uni- unique, um, Dom, and if I could just make a little plug here, mm-hmm. is something that in- excited and inspired me so much about these products. And now I've since, of course, come across other products that are similar, at least from the standpoint of, of what I'm going to say now. But basically, you know, we, we have so much products to say we, we live in a society which is, you know, we need to consume, you know, we need to purchase, we need to live. And we, this is something we can't get away from. But people are trying to consume more consciously. But sometimes you go and you get something that's organic, quote unquote, but then you hear something like, oh, but do you know what impact that's causing on the people? You do you know the, the conditions they're working in? Or this one is all about good conditions of people and good livelihoods, but this is um, well, productive to the environment. example of that, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's so many cases and, uh, and and it's a real struggle for people to say, you know, I really am trying to make a difference, but I get this T-shirt and I'm feeling good about it. And someone says, oh, you know, it's organic, but it's causing all this, this trouble in Pakistan and people are not being treated properly. And it's very, very difficult for people. And what I gives me, you know, inspires me about these products is they are arguably, if you will, 100 percent socially positive and 100 percent environmentally positive. So they're meeting those targets of 100% social and environmental. I have another colleague, I'll just as another example, let's just say that they're, they're out there, but she had a company in Peru called Life Out of Plastic Loop. And what they do is they make these beautiful bags. They take plastic bottles, they make a fabric, and then they make bags with a beautiful fabric. But then they also get the local indigenous people to embroider on it. So here you have stunning pieces of art and they're bags that I would be happy to wear and use. And it's 100% social and 100% environmental. So this idea that we can produce products that are quote unquote 100% conscious is real. And, um, and it's that, that's what we find quite inspiring about the possibility of, of actually beginning to consume more consciously, you know. And therefore, we're happy that this is one example of those products. But we also are on a bit of a mission and an exciting mission to, to find more products like this as well, you know. I, well, you had me at hello. <laughs> Good, we'll, we'll keep you until the end of the sentence and the paragraph and the essay and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> please do. Kevin, please continue. Sure, no problem. So I, I spoke about the, the workshops. So what are we doing in these communities that participants have uh, the opportunity to be trained at three different levels during this program? Um, so level one is the technical and theoretical education and educational training session level two is level one plus field and installation actual practical in field work um, level three is the level two plus you know the core part core participants for the full vps training um three technical and theoretical educational training session green business and opportunities um and they've worked at least three or more separate days on various better bear system installations so basically, like these level threes are going to be um, very adapting 
adapting sorry um, effective air system and implementing it and you know that goes from land prep to plan prep to insulation to maintenance to full works. So can I ask so, a question? How are you implementing these vetiver workshops? Is it that um, you are going into communities or is and working with a very specific specific groups of people, or is this something that the wider public can get on board with? So I'll, I'll just jump in there yeah. and give a little response to that, Dom. So as you can see, we decided to treat it as three different levels, recognizing that we're sort of reaching people at all levels at different times and giving different amounts of education. And we absolutely want to recognize and even find a way to track, you know, but how many people and who we're engaging with. So we certainly consider if someone had a good conversation or a presentation, they've learned something. So Mm -hmm. we found the decision to sort of acknowledge that as a level one. And then if they actually get into the field and they work with us, they become a level two if they get some experience. And therefore, you know, to that end, we're sort of finding and, and empowering and sort of engaging with many new people over time that we'll call level ones and twos all of the time, you know, even persons on this program, I would say, we can probably constitute as getting a level one training, if you will, because they've learned a fair bit. But, you know, it's arguable because there's a few more technical things, but they've definitely gotten some good information. But then the level threes, which Kev referred to, that is really more of a targeted approach under the VEAT model, which is the Vet of Education Empowerment Project model, which, you know, has a number of things, but for it to succeed, it has to do with things like identifying the right partner in the community, you know. So, for example, Lopino Tourism Association and Lopino United Way in Maruga, different regional corporations that become our key partners. We work with them. We identify participants in the communities. We find this core group of participants. And then with them, we go through this series of uh, several workshops. So they get a full in-depth on the workshops, a, sig- a certain amount of field experience, maintenance, site adoption, etc. So the persons who do level three really have this full gamut of experience that's a bit more than level ones and twos. But in fact, we, we do consider someone who's trained at level three as somebody who can train others at levels one and two, you know? So that's part of a way that we want to explore in terms of, you know, the ongoing expansion of this, the recognition that persons which we've properly trained in Trinidad and Tobago, but including on the other islands, can also become trainers of their own, you know, in terms of taking the knowledge forward to others, at least at the level one and two stage, you know? You know, and what I also like about that is, you know, we're in a situation where people are in need of um, of skills and skill sharing really is for me, it's the way forward in terms of how we develop our communities in a in a holistic way. And this this strikes me as a really good opportunity to learn new skills um, to to broaden. And again, as you've rightly said, this was ancestral knowledge that was lost so we can really pull it back into, into our daily cultural, you know, goings on and utilize it in a way that is, that is critical as we move forward in a sustainable, um, with sustainable practices within society. And especially as job losses are high, you know, maybe this is something that, you know, we can start by, by learning a new skill. We can start by going out and, and volunteering with Miwi Green and really just getting back into the community and and making a very positive impact. So thank you guys. So getting into the Vetiver Handicraft Workshop. So these are some of the Vetiver Handicrafts that have been produced. And on the right side, you know, you actually have the mats, the basket, the chairs. These are all made from Vetiver leaves. So Jonathan, yeah. tell me, how are you expanding up the islands right now? And what's that reception like? Yeah, so I mean... You know, we, uh, again, you know, since completing the first VEAP model project in 2016-17 in Parman, which is supported by the GF Small Grants Program, you know, we did get the interest and support to grow locally here, and we went to quarries, and then we got partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank Lab to grow nationally across Trinidad a bit. But, you know, that was still more targeted. And finally, of course, the Miri Green Program, which is really fully national. But um, we were also getting inquiries and interests of the islands. So that's kind of what led us to, to sort of explore those opportunities. And that led, well, there's two projects actually, but last year we did, it was a small GEF, small grants program in Grenada. So we did the VPS two-week training there. But yeah, so now we are working as, um, you know, the lead technical implementing partner for a regional project, which is being led by the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, ICA. Mm-hmm. but it is being funded by the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. 
And so this is a project which, you know, began development back in 2018, original concept, no development approvals in 2019 and really kicked off in 2020. Of course, we face serious COVID challenges throughout, you know, for implementation, even though it's a multi-year project. So, you know, I'm really grateful we were able to push through because we're now about halfway through a bit beyond in the project. And finally, this wet season, which was very, very critical, we were able to really kick off with the full implementation in Tobago, firstly, since we're here, and then Dom St. Lucia, Dominica, and Antigua. And basically what that consisted of, of course, the project is being supported at the national, um, in each country, you know, because the ICA has offices in each country, and that has really allowed for them to be working there, supporting the NGOs in development of the project. Um, but then IA Movement providing all technical support relating to the Vetiver system. And then finally, you know, planning development and then coming in to do this sort of core, what we call the core two week v VS implementation program, you know, which is when we really come in and with the participants that have been selected, we work with them, have a series of workshops, um, classroom workshops, pretty intensive, but very interactive, lots of kind of discussions about the local context and how it works with them, um, hands on activities in the afternoon. And then in each country, we go in on the second week into the field. And we would have already identified some sites, but we really spend time with, you know, up to 15, 20 participants, but completing Vetiver installations. So during my time in those countries, Dominica, St. Lucia, Antigua, um, and Dominica, you know, we install about six to 8,000 plants in each country in that one to two week period. Um, but very importantly, we kind of help them, obviously, by the end of it, have, having the full training and understanding, but develop their programs to move forward where the local NGOs is a non-profit organization in each country, which takes lead. Um, I can make a quick mention of them, but Environment Tobago in Tobago, um, the Canaries Community Improvement Foundation in St. Lucia, Piti Soufre, San Sauveur Village Council in Dominica, and the Guard Center in Antigua. You know, and these local NGOs um, are really the ones that have to carry it forward and, and um, will be taking all the installations forward up to 50, 60,000 plants per country. Mm -hmm. um, but while also supporting development of green business and all of that, which I am one will support, Eco will support, etc. Basically, I just wanted to share, you know, I know I spoke earlier quite a bit about mulching and so on. So I just want to give a quick few pictures of what that looks like so people can be aware. And, you know, I'm starting in Paramount with some of the same pictures Kev had just as that little reminder. You see the landslide right behind the hedgerow. But I thought it interesting here because you can actually see another case of it. It wasn't a one-off. You can see here another hedgerow. And if you look, you see that dark patch beneath it, another landslide that took place just beneath the hedgerow. So you can really see what happens is the land wants to move. We don't know when land is going to slip, but you know, all we know is a, a big shower can result in it becoming saturated and going down, you know? So what that vetiver does is it creates a security barrier to sort of prevent that taking place. And that could happen around your property, your homes, your houses, not purely agri agriculture. We work a lot with farmers, but um, as you mentioned, um, you know, while we work with farmers, we also work with, you know, it's really everybody that we're connecting to with this. And the picture you see, the lower one, you can kind of just see some hedgerows scattered across the agricultural plot, you know. But um, Jonathan, coming... I wanted to um, kind of highlight how effective this is to our audience by actually, and this is a term that I learned from your IAM movement team, the vetive grass is like a natural retaining wall. And I exactly. think that's a very powerful statement to me because we all know how expensive real retaining walls are. So Correct. if we yeah. have something else that is way lower in cost and yeah. obviously proven effectiveness, certainly that's something for, for beyond agriculture, but for uh, households. Absolutely. So we kind of see it as an underground curtain of roots, you know, that does that. So just coming right back in here, um, so just showing you this little demonstration of the mulching now. So here you can see, you know, some kale has been planted. And this is in Trinidad, but I was referring again to countries like Antigua, but it's really throughout the Caribbean. We saw a woman in the Kalanago territory in Dominica who practices this in a huge way, and it was very, very profound to see. But if you can just imagine, you know, with nothing around these plants, weeds grow up, rain falls, washes off topsoil, it dries out easily. And this is what the vetiver looks like as a mulch, you know. So it's simply spreading these leaves around the plants. And what that does is it really has this effect of keeping down weeds, keeping moisture in the soil, breaking down over time. So it's so simple, but you know, where persons will have this in their garden and they think, you know, I don't know what that plant is. I don't know what to use it for. Just the very act of chopping and dropping makes your hedgerow look clean, neat, nice, and beautiful. But at the same time, these leaves can be put, you know, 
around even you know garden plants as a, as a means to keeping down weeds and keeping moisture in the soil you know that's um, yeah so that mulching is a really powerful thing that we you know we really believe that we're obviously trying to touch on many different levels including again the homes infrastructure livelihoods but from the farming and agricultural standpoint we think that if this is really taken on you know that i mean uh, the simple tool alone we think can help farmers make a big move towards sustainable agriculture you know um and the last pictures i'll just throw up i know kev had mentioned it but i thought it'd be nice for everyone to see just some more handicrafts but you can see here you know beautiful baskets mats on the top right roots you know being used to make christmas decorations and so on and this is the brand house of vetive that local sort of community focused brand kev mentioned and here you can see um, some some making. You can actually see on the top left a paramin um, guy, Mr. Scotty, producing a beautiful chair. And you can see mats and, and chairs made from another paramin person down below. So you know, there's so many different things. Um, and then this was we use this as an example. It was another community brand in Trinidad, Turtle Warrior, that made stunning sea sea glass jewelry. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we actually use it as an example while we were developing this product to show communities, you know, how how far this product can go in terms of its branding and development and that type of thing, you know? So it's all in development now, um, but it's really, you know, humbling and rewarding to see uh, what the engagement is like, the interest, and we hope we can take it as far as it can go, you know? Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. On behalf of the Catholic Commission for Social Justice and the Archdiocese Ministries for Migrants and Refugees, thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Ask Why and enjoy your evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Take hey, care. Thanks very much.